welcome everybody to another week of the Global Cafe. Lovely to see so many familiar faces. Um, so as Luana said, my name is Kara Cruz and I'm a Senior Policy and Project Coordinator at the International Federation on Aging. Today, I am very excited to be introducing you all to Ketty Crystal and Claire Hurst, who are based out of Western Australia. So last week we had Professor Martins also in Western Australia. Um, they're being well represented on the cafe this month, um, and they will be sharing their experiences on supporting the development of the intergenerational um, LGBTQI age friendly um, stories project, which um, resulted in the creation of a booklet called Our Voices Have Changed the World. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on today's speakers, um, Ketty has worked in the field of domestic and family violence from 1983 to 2016. And currently she is the executive officer for uh, LGBTQI rights in aging, a not-for-profit community-based organization um, working to ensure that older LGBTI people are safe and respected. Ketty has been a lesbian activist since 1982 in Western Australia in rural um, NSW, Women's Land. Um, she was the co-editor of the Laughing Medusa, a bi-monthly lesbian magazine. Um, and her services have been publicly recognized as um, the 2006 Western Australia Citizen of the Year, 2007 Western Australian 100 Local Champions Award, and in 2011, she was elected to the International Women's Day Hall of Fame. Uh, she became a Justice of Peace in 1999 and is currently a director on the board of Tender Funerals uh, WA, committee member on the Women's Hall of Fame board, um, and the Court Welfare Service, a member of the SHQ LGBTQI Advisory Group and the City of Perth's LGBTQI Plus Advisory Board. Um, so we are very happy to have you here with us today, Ketty. Um, we also have Claire Hurst. So Claire is Director of Inclusion Policy and Design at the Department of Communities, Western Australia. Claire is privileged to lead a number of portfolio areas that comprise of inclusion policy. Um, these areas are seniors and aging, elder abuse, volunteering, youth, women inter women's interests, cares, and LGBTQI plus um, inclusion as well. Claire has over 20 years of public uh, sector experience in state government agencies in both Western Australia and Queensland governments, specializing in strategy development, legislative reform and community engagement to affect positive social impact and change. Most recently, Claire has oversighted the development of the first Western Australian Seniors Strategy and Age-Friendly WA, the new Youth Action Plan to be launched later this year, and establishing the LGBTQIA plus strategy team responsible for the development of the recently announced whole of government LGBTQIA plus inclusion strategy for Western Australia. So we are absolutely honored to have the both of you with us here today. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for Ketty. So Ketty, as shared in your bio, you've been involved in a career advocating for individuals who may be at risk for marginalization for over 40 years. So what drew you to this career trajectory? Um, thank you. Um, as mentioned, I came out as a lesbian uh, feminist in 1982. At the time, there was a lot of work happening around women's refuges and the feminist movement. And I, at that time, had come out of a uh, violent marriage. So that was a lot of my motivating factor for getting in, working in the area of domestic and family violence for about 35 years. And alongside that work, um, I was an activist in the lesbian community for many years. And I guess my motivating desire has been to work with and work alongside people to make direct and urgent changes. I'm not very good at waiting for things to change. I, have, I like to get out there and start doing things to make change happen that improves the lives for everyone, everyone, but in particular for me, women and girls and children. In my last years of working now as an older person, it's a fabulous opportunity to continue to work 
uh, and uh, progress the work of Gray and make a difference to the lives of older LGBTI people. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I, I like that observation of action, of getting things done. We need more people like that. Um, so could you share a little bit more um, with us about Gray and the services it provides? Sure. So Gray was started in 2005 to protect the rights and well-being of older LGBTI people. We're a community controlled, culturally safe and not-for-profit organization working to ensure that older LGBTI people, 50 plus years, will be safe and welcomed wherever they are. We're the only organization in the whole of Australia who's focus as an LGBTI organisation is solely on older, uh, the older cohort. So we undertake research, training and service delivery. So we had a piece, recent piece of research in 2003, which was the first uh, survey of Western Australian older LGBTI people that explored their current physical and mental health, their housing and financial situations, their attitudes to ageing, and one of the most surprising pieces of uh, uh, data that came out of that research was the finding that LGBTI people aged 50 to 64 years were actually the most lonely of, of that age group, which we found very interesting. We also deliver regular training into the aged care sector to help aged care providers to be more inclusive and welcoming to older LGBTI people who need an aged care package either in their home or who are going into a residential facility. And just recently, we launched an intergenerational housing pilot that will connect older LGBTI people who have a spare room to LGBTIQA plus university students who are in need of accommodation. Australia, quite across Australia, we have a current housing shortage which particularly impacts younger people and students on low incomes. So our focus is um, LGBTI university students and in particular international LGBTI students coming to Australia to study. In addition to that, Gray provides a range of social events for older LGBTI people. So we have monthly games afternoons, we have a couple of book clubs, we have film screenings, we do lunches and workshops. And we also run another program using uh, younger LGBTI QA plus volunteers who uh, go into residential aged care and visit older LGBTI people in residential care who need a, a friendly visitor who pops in, you know, once a week just to see how they're going. Thank you. So it seems like intergenerational connections are a bit of a foundational um, like approach throughout the organization. Is that correct? Yes. Um, one of the things that came out of the survey was that older people themselves said they actually preferred to, have to go to things where there was an intergenerational age range rather than just a seniors event for people over 65. Well, that's interesting. And we'll definitely get into that um, further. But first, I wanted to ask, um, so you said in the survey, you found that um, individuals aged between, was it 50 and 64, they experienced the most loneliness, um, which is quite interesting. But how is the experience of aging for individuals who identify as LGBTQI um, different or unique, um, would you say? So what we know from the um, research is that um, compared to heterosexual older people, older LGBTI people are twice as likely to be single as they age two and a half times likely to, more, to live alone and four times less likely to have children. So all of those uh, factors that many heterosexual people have, a partner and children and someone to live with, are not there for many older LGBTI people as they age. In addition, many of our older people may have experienced a lifetime where they've been rejected from their biological family at an early age. They may have experienced um, abuse and violence from the community. They may have experienced attempts by the medical profession to cure their homosexuality as a young person. They may have experienced um, conversion practices by faith-based organisations, all of which will have had an impact on their mental health as a young person and as the person um, ageing. 
So often they may have you have an increased use of alcohol and higher levels of depression and anxiety. They may be living with the long-term effects of HIV. So they have, have this life history of disadvantage often. And they also then face the additional fear that aged care services, which are often faith-based organisations here in Australia, will reject and discriminate against them. And that the, they are faced with the, the um, belief that they will have to go back into the closet if they're going to be safe when they go into an aged care facility. Okay, thank you um, for sharing. Um, and really looking forward to continuing that conversation um, further. But I wanted to turn over to Claire. Um, thank you, Claire, for joining us today. I understand there's some technical difficulties, so I hope you can hear us. Um, thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so could you share with us some uh, more information on the age-friendly Western Australia state senior strategy and maybe perhaps tell us a little bit more about how does a strategy guide government policy? Sure. Thanks so much for the invitation to join you. I do apologise for joining a bit late. I hope you can hear me and yes. do let me know if um, it sounds like there's any technological issues. Um, before I jump into the to the answer, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, I join you from this evening, and that is the Woodjack um, people of the Noongar Nation here in, in Perth, WA. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, the Western Australian government has developed um, its first uh, WA senior strategy, and that guides a whole of community actions um, in being responsive to older people's wants and needs and aspirations, um, with our aim to, to ensure that Western Australia is a place where older adults can thrive and live out the best life. Um, so the strategy itself sets out the whole of government and whole of community priorities and commitments. Um, and it does that under four pillars for building a fulfilling life for older people. And those four pillars are thriving physically, mentally and spiritually, safe and ageing communities, staying connected and engaged and having views that are heard. So these themes and issues um, came out of stakeholder consultation um, and guide our key activities under the first five year action plan. So some of the examples of the initiatives under our strategy um, are, is the establishment of a new seniors peak body, uh, a program that we have called the Age Friendly Grants Program uh, for local governments and community organizations um, that's in place to implement age friendly initiatives the development of an information package for seniors, which looks at information dissemination across both online and hard copy um, media. And we also have an awareness campaign too, around ageism specifically. Um, I'd also just quickly like to mention that since the release of the seniors strategy, um, the age friendly strategy, we've also started work with across the Department of Communities on behalf of the WA state government um, in the development of an LGBTIQA plus uh, inclusion strategy. Um, so I'm happy to share some details about that a bit later as well. Fantastic. And I can see we're already having some questions in the chat um, relating to that. Um, but first, I want to turn um, to kind of a question about how did the government identify the priorities for the strategy? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, very extensive consultation uh, with a broad of, of a broad range of stakeholders um, right across the state. Um, we, in fact, had more than 2,600 older people um, participating in face-to-face -face and online consultation um, through hard copy submissions, an online survey and phone interviews as well. Um, the strategy acknowledges the, the views of LGBTIQ older people um, gathered through the consultations um, during the draft of the strategy and in representation, representations by our colleagues in grey. Um, feedback from the consultations um, enabled us to look at the importance of establishing and maintaining supportive 
non-judgmental uh, connections with the community um, for LGBTIQ older people um, and really focus on, on aspects like maintaining mental health and well-being as the age, which Katie has touched on uh, just a moment ago. Um, so yeah, a range of themes arose from, from those consultations and were captured uh, and used to identify a number of the actions listed in that first action plan that I mentioned a moment ago. Fantastic. Yeah. And I believe there's a link in the chat to that action plan, should anyone be interested. Um, so coming to the topic of today's session, Ketty, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the Intergenerational Storytelling Project? Yep, sure. So as Claire said, one of the um, actions in the first five years as part of the strategy was the Intergenerational LGBTI Project. Um, and we were very excited about this um, and we um, reached out to our community with, um, with the idea that um, we would start, undertake this project. And there was a, a great deal of interest. Um, we had a very quick engagement from all people of under the letters of the acronym. And then we also had really good engagement for a, from a group of younger volunteers, younger LGBTI QA plus people who volunteered their time. And so we ran a half day training session with them before we, we then matched them to an older person who'd put up their hand to indicate they would be willing to share their life story. One of the outcome requirements of the funding from the Department of Communities is, was that we had a minimum of 10 intergenerational peers. So the peers, the younger people had to be 25 and older, um, and the older people that were sharing their story had to be uh, 50 plus, but we had 50% of those connections had to be with people who were 65 plus years. So the project exceeded the requirements. So we have 16 stories in the book. That was a total of 14 peers connected together and two additional stories that were received. And of the participants, nine out of the 16 participants were between 65 and 77 years of age. So over this, this project started in about April last year. And we received a treasure trove of stories in greater volume and depth than we could actually include in the book. So one of the things that we have done is that we have the entire interview recordings that were done, along with the edited transcripts, will go to the WA State Library. They will be held in the archives and in the LGBTI collection, which is not great in our library. So it's, it would be a lovely boost for that collection. And it will be there for future historians and future researchers to um, access. Um, so one of the things that we did at the end of the project was to ask both the participants and the volunteers to um, provide us with some feedback about their experience. And one of this is a, one of the quotes from one of the volunteers, Nick. So Nick said, Meeting and connecting and conversing with John has been one of the most meaningful experiences of my year. The oral history project offered a light, helpful and supportive structure for us to engage through, creating a purposeful way for us to connect. I'm so grateful for John's generosity in sharing so openly and thoughtfully. It has been so informative, insightful and moving. And that, I think is you know it sums up the whole tone of all the stories in the book. One of the things that we were really faced with is that the interviews range from about three thousand words to about thirty three thousand words, and so the editing process for the poor editor was extremely difficult, trying to condense it down to about fifteen hundred words. Um, so each, which is what each roughly what each story. Uh, length is. In addition to the, the work from the participants and the volunteers, we had one of our local LGBTI um, photography groups come on board and we had an afternoon session where uh, a portrait was taken of each of the participants. So we, the book also has not quite, it has about 14 beautiful pictures of the 16 participants in it. And that, that was an additional thing that the photography group came to us with um, and, that, and has actually, you know, been a real nice addition to the book. 
yeah, I think having that visual, it really makes the person real, you know, when you're looking at it and they're gorgeous, gorgeous photos. Yeah. And we're coming out of this, you know, the, my board is extremely um, keen for us to do this project again next year because we actually came across many more people with fabulous stories than we could fit in this book. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, to, to, to capture the stories from our community as they age and before they pass away and we lose them is really, really important. Yeah, I know when I was, I've had the opportunity to read probably two thirds of the stories um so far um and yes just the amount of history that's um within the stories especially a history of activism um is quite meaningful um but one of my favorite quotes um from the story was from a man named david gibson and he shared so here's to the young soldier who wanted to serve his country who weathered the storm and stumbled through the darkness to emerge stronger and prouder, and finally as an older man ready to share his story. Um, so I thought that was really meaningful. Um, why do you think individuals are attracted to sharing their stories? And what do you think it meant to them to share their stories? All of the people that shared their stories had a really genuine, genuine desire to share and inform younger members of our community and the, and the community, the wider community, but particularly the younger members of the LGBTI community about their journey, about a journey where, you know, being an LGBTI person has, it has been illegal, has been uh, seen as a medical illness, has seen, been seen as something that needed to be punished and, or treated in some way. And they all have um, not only fabulous stories to share, but they all want to help younger people understand that life isn't, you know, life can throw up lots and lots of challenges for you, but with resilience and perseverance and connection, you know, you can survive, we can survive and we can be stronger and, and society can be better for all of us, for all of us. Yeah, thank you for summarizing that. And that was another theme I noticed, the kind of when someone lived in a community, whether a community is chosen family or community in the larger community, that really seemed to have made a difference um, in them embracing themselves. Um, so how can the book um, created as a result of the project be used to increase knowledge? Um, so I know you spoke about informing carers of older LGBTI individuals. Um, what's your strategy to kind of, um, I guess, maximize its impact? So one of the main area that we want to get it out to is into um, aged care facilities. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, you know, we will be have started advertising into the aged care sector to say, this book is free, it's available, we will, deliver it to you, you can come and pick it up from us. It will also go out into our libraries. Um, it'll go into senior citizens organizations. It'll go to local governments. It'll go basically to where any, where older people will be able to see it and, and read it and pick it up and use it as a starting point to have conversations about change and community and difference and acceptance all of those sorts of uh, questions. So um, it's had some promotion in this week. It was launched on Tuesday. Uh, we're getting some media coverage. We will, you know, we're working really hard. It's available on our website as a downloadable copy. So it can be accessed, you know, by anybody all over the world. And I, you know, it's Western Australian, but I think the stories in it are relevant to anybody anywhere in the world. Certainly, and um, I know a lot of the individuals who participate in the project weren't necessarily born in um, Western Australia. It is a, quite a global um, collection of individuals. Mm -hmm. So Claire, I do wanna to turn to you um, to ask more about the project and how it contributes to Western Australia's age-friendly strategy. But first I see that we have a question that I think the both of you um, could potentially answer. So this is from, Shmuel. Shmuel is a regular contributor to the IFA Global Cafe. 
And so he's asking, how does the intergenerational initiative contribute to the improved social well-being of older persons who may be from low socioeconomic um, backgrounds? So I'm not sure which one of you would like to answer that question. Uh, can you just repeat it again, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so how does the intergenerational aspect of the storytelling project um, contribute to the improved social well-being of older persons from low socioeconomic groups? Um, so it doesn't have to be regarding their economic status, but do you feel that it contributes to their social well-being um, at all? Um, I, I, mean, I guess for me, it would contribute to their social well-being if it helps them feel more connected or helps establish a connection possibly back to Gray as an organisation that may be able to provide them with some other resources if they're not well connected socially. Um, depending on where they are. I mean, Western Australia is a massively huge state. And so it's very easy to be socially isolated in this state, particularly outside of the, the city re or the regional town areas. Um, we've, we've tried very hard to have a range of people and not in terms of their own experiences of social wellbeing and um, yeah, economic status and all of that within the book as well. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. What do you think, Claire? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, certainly answers the question. Um, from from Department of Communities perspective, um, under the auspices of the the senior strategy, we um, very much promote the the social well being and inclusion of older people through the notion of aging in place. And I think the, the Live Stories booklet, knowing that it's going to be available across libraries um, in various places, various venues across the state, provides a real opportunity for others in our local communities to, to read the stories and share experiences of their own and connect with others. And that's really powerful, yeah. Yeah, certainly, thank you, thank you both. Um, so Claire, the Government of Western Australia is an affiliate member alongside the IFA of the Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, so our audience will be quite familiar. We've had many affiliates on at this point, which has been so, so wonderful, and I know a few are on the call today. Um, so how does the Intergenerational Storytelling Project contribute to Western Australia's age-friendly initiatives? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Western Australia is very proud to be an affiliate member of the Global Network. Um, and we take our commitment really seriously with regards to building age friendly communities um, where older people can really be valued. Um, so the principles of age friendly um, are the foundation of our work for older people. And I've, I've touched on a moment ago that age friendly approach is, is at the core of um, about inclusion. And part of that approach is recognizing older people um, are not one homogenous group. Uh, there's great diversity amongst older people, and this is why this project specifically in our work with Grey um, to ensure the views and unique stories of older LGBT people are shared and heard, and they're so important. Um, so the project contributes to our age-friendly work by seeking to build a connection uh, and understanding across generations to address loneliness and address ageism uh, by encouraging this intergenerational connection. Um, and this work not only contributes to work to implement our age-friendly strategy, but also our elder abuse strategy, um, which uh, you can also find on our, on our website. There's a specific um, action under that priority area too, around prevention and early intervention of, of elder abuse, which is about older people feeling um, and being valued and respected and socially in included. So these two strategies together drive our work in the seniors ageing and elder abuse portfolio of Department of Communities and, and the work of Gray and this book um, really kind of come together and complement that. Thank you. And it's great to see the impact of this inclusive framework within various mm. government strategies. Um, 
So another question for the both of you from uh, Dominic Boyd. Dominic, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Thank you very much. Uh, nice to talk with people from Australia. I'm originally from Melbourne. Uh, my question revolves around dementia. I'm a member of the uh, Nova, the uh, Alzheimer's Society in Nova Scotia. And I'm very concerned about the social well-being of people with dementia. So in terms of your survey and your book and your work, um, what have you learned about how people from the rainbow community are um, a sort of affected when we think about early onset, like people in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, um, people from whatever age in their early stage, uh, mild cognitive impairment, early stage dementia, what community resources are there? How are they treated? Um, are there to uh, types of additional discrimination that uh, uh, occur? And in what ways is the age-friendly um, program you're working with connected to a dementia-friendly? So I know that's a lot, <laughs> but um, I am very interested to hear, uh, you know, how the uh, Rainbow community are um, sort of uh, affected more, perhaps more vulnerable if they start to have uh, symptoms of dementia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, Ketty or Claire, which one of you would like to give a go at answering? Maybe part of the question. Um, well, I'll start with the, the small amount I can add. Um, I, I think w one of the things we know from research here in Australia is that um, LGBTI people tend to often not access health um, facilities and health medical assistance very early. We have a tendency because of our fears of discrimination and prejudice and our past experiences of that to leave things till they get to a crisis point. So I would say that there's a, a great danger for our community that we're not accessing services early enough and particularly in, in the area of dementia and early diagnosis of dementia. Um, there is one good resource that I know, which has been put together by um, L um, LGBTI Health Australia, which is the peak body for um, Gray and no a number of other organisations. And that is a specific uh, LGBTI dementia resource booklet, which is available on the LHA website. Um, and that, that's aimed at um, professionals dealing with dementia generally in the community to be more inclusive, so they're more inclusive of L LGBTI people at that stage. Um, outside of that, we've done some training, you know, into the dementia um, area and the Al Alzheimer's Association here to help them be, be more inclusive of LGBTI people. But I think it's an area we still have a lot lot more work to do and thanks so much Kelly. yeah Where thank you anything? i can yeah. yeah thank you um I, I was also going to touch on that wonderful booklet that that Keddie mentioned i think that's really an exemplar um um strategy and useful guide um, that, that people can have a look at. Um, the state government has done some work previously around dementia friendly communities over a number of years. And the senior strategy does touch on um, thriving and living in place and, and aging in place, as I mentioned earlier. And being a whole of government strategy, it does touch on a lot of um, health components specifically in the action plan. Um, and going forward, as, as Katie mentioned, there is a lot more we can do. Um, so through consultation under the development of the new LGBTIA plus uh, 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 inclusion strategy, beg your pardon, um, we want to really ensure that there is a health component there. Uh, so that the government has a, a health strategy for LGBTIQA plus um, people, and we'll be looking at how that can expand specifically for older people um, going forward. Yeah, so watch this space. It's an interesting way, way of um, expanding on further work. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I'm seeing um, some individuals are asking for links, and I see Michael, I think you provided that link. Okay. So thank you very much um, okay. for that, much appreciated. 
Um, just to turn on to um, a question kind of returning to the intergenerational um, nature of the project. So a theme that I noticed within some of the stories was the importance attributed to the acceptance of younger family members of their loved one's sexuality. Um, so there was Finn, whose grandson um, described Finn, who um, explained to his grandson that he was born in the wrong body, who his grandson, um, I believe the words he used were, that's so cool. Um, and then there was Jilly, who, um, her daughter, Evie, was an enthusiastic ally who felt quite confident in sharing her parents' story when perhaps um, Jilly was more tentative or apprehensive um, about sharing her story. So how did you come to the decision to have younger people be so involved in this project? And do you think that this um, dynamic between the interviewer and the interviewee um, influenced how the stories were told? Um, so the, the criteria when we were um, shaping up the project was, um, and it was actually for people 25 and plus, we, we didn't ask, we didn't seek out younger people partly because we, there was considerations around um, police certificates and those sorts of things. And, you know, it makes it, you know, we, we, the, in, we agreed with the department in line that if we worked with people that were 25 plus, it was going to be a, a little bit better for everybody's mental health because sometimes stories mm -hmm. might be told that might have been distressing for a younger person as well. So the criteria was the interviewer had to be 25 or old, older. So it didn't really go down to quite the younger ages that we some of the we were talking about there in terms of the participants sharing with family members. Um, but I think what 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 the what the, the story shows that in the last probably fifty years there has been such a rapid change in the way society views the LGBTI community, the language we use, the pronouns we use, the our understanding of sexuality, sexual identity, and gender identity has changed so much that. We now have a generation coming through and they're particularly around that generation now that's sort of just hitting high school, working their way through high school, that have completely different ideas about sexual identity and gender identity and language that even for us, us older people, you know, it's way out of our um, understanding sometimes and one of the things Gray has done in the last year or so is actually run workshops for our older community members about pronouns and about gender language and um, some of the new terms around sexual identity and things because for many of our older people, this is, this is all very new as well. So while we have a, a wonderful level of acceptance coming through with younger people, um, it just sort of, I guess, highlights how much things have changed and you know, probably 50 years, you know, and the change has been, particularly in the Western world, probably very marked. And that that's what you're, you know, you're seeing when you see those sort of comments and those stories, I think. Yeah, um, that's really fascinating, this idea of how quickly the world has changed and how can an individual kind of keep up or to come to understand various perspectives that perhaps are more common amongst one age group versus another. Um, Claire, do you have anything that you would like to add um, regarding the government's focus on an intergenerational aspect? Um, I, I think I'd like to, to touch on the elder abuse strategy and associated action plan. What, what we're seeing, and there's a lot of research out there, is, is, is that um, notion of ageism and um, the elder abuse component of that, um, where we see um, familial abuse, um, for example, where, uh, you know, we, we hear stories where um, older people can um, suffer financially because they're not familiar with um, more... <laughs> more um, modern banking 
uh, concepts and things like that. So um, I think there's an, a number of areas uh, where promoting um, elder abuse and raising awareness about elder abuse, but also how we can encourage um, younger generations to support older people and those in their family to to better understand, um, you know, things like web and banking and online and scams. Um, because because um, people that, that are a bit more vulnerable, like our older people, um, can absolutely be taken advantage of in that space. So yeah, there's some there's some really great reading in our elder abuse strategy um, in that space. So I'd, I'd point um, out people online to that. Thank you for that. And just making note that all of the resources will be available on the IFA's website, um, usually a few hours after the cafe. Um, for anyone interested in following up and of course welcome to reach out to me as well i believe you all have my email but i can ask the one to put it in the chat as well thanks um we next have a question from katherine klein would you like to ask your question katherine sure thanks and i am so excited to be visiting your country i hope to western australia in november with my husband um but i wondered since we all acknowledge <laughs> that every group is diverse have you reached out to any of the indigenous communities? Because I wondered how they would react. And again, they, I'm sure, is a huge issue. So maybe different communities have different values. Some of them may accept LGBTQI people and some may not. But I just was curious if you've had any conversations with them. Thanks. Yes, I did. Um, towards the end of the project's time um i worked really really um uh, worked to try and see if i could get a the story from an indigenous man who lived in a regional area of wa um and unfortunately it didn't it, it didn't come off in terms of being and finally getting his consent to share it but we see that i mean that's one of the reasons we would like to to do the book um, several more times is because there is a number of fantastic stories from our older Indigenous LGBTI people that uh, need to be captured as well. Um, and also, we also have not got a really good representation from uh, people with a culturally and linguistically diverse background as well. Mm -hmm. uh, often it's quite hard to get the stories from, they're even more hidden than some of our older people are, the Indigenous older um, LGBTI people, but they are there. Um, sister girls and brother boys are, are part of many of the um, Indigenous community, First Nations communities in Australia, and their stories are really important to, to, to record. Um, so, yeah, to, if we did it again, we would make sure that we have a little bit more diversity in the book. That's the one thing it does lack. Thank you, Kelly. Claire, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you. Yeah, from a more broader perspective under the same senior strategy, um, a lot of our consultation w was statewide, um, both in, in metro and regional, but also remote areas. And um, noting that uh, the topics were really sensitive and, you know, we, we don't necessarily want government people tra traipsing up to um, remote areas uh, in Aboriginal communities. Uh, we, we engage some Aboriginal people um, specialising in consultation and um, with, with knowledge of working with older um, Australians as well um, to, to undertake some work for us in that space. So we were really able to capture the views and opinions and the lived experience and the stories of, of older um, older Australians, WW Australians. And um, as we plan forward to, to undertake some consultation also with the LGBTIQA plus inclusion strategy, we'll be doing the same and, and touching and working really closely with um, organisations that, that specialise um, and, and link with um, older Australians, LGBT Australians, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so Kelly, you've spoken a few times about doing the project again in future um, versions or um, approaches to the project. 
For anyone on the call today who may be interested um, in doing something similar, what advice would you give them? <laughs> um, I'm not wanting to, you know, blow Gray's trumpet, but I think you actually you need an LGBTI organisation that specialises and focuses on older members of the LGBTIQA plus community as your lead agency because this it requires a great deal of trust and a great deal of um, courage for people to share their stories and they need to know that they you know the 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 agency is going to be respectful and it's going to treat their stories and treat them in a very um, respectful and um, honest way and that there's you know that they're, they're they're safe to sell, tell their story in that way. The other thing I would learn is that work out what your word limit is up front so that people, people don't, you know, feel like they're going to tell their story and it's going to be there, you know, however, however long that they want it to be. We, um, one of the things that we were absolutely um, determined to do is that the story that went in was the story that was approved by the person at the end of the day and some of those stories went back several times before we got to the point where the, the participant the story owner said I don't want I want you to take this bit out or I don't want I don't want to put this bit in now I've thought about it and even when we thought oh that's that we're really sad that we, we're taking this bit out because that's a really significant piece of information at the end of the day we had we honored that was their story and everything that went in was approved by the each person before it went anywhere else, you know. So I think that's really crucial, mm -hmm. um, so that people have the confidence to know. Because often, when you're having an interview, you're having a conversation with somebody, you can say a whole lot of things that, in hindsight, you think maybe I don't want to put that in the book after all. And you know, they've got to feel confident that, that that's going to be respected in that process. Yes, and I think in an individual conversation, it can feel quite natural to share something. But then when you think mm -hmm. about the whole world, that's a whole other matter. Yeah, um, yeah I like your labeling it as like the story owner and who has the right um, to kind of yeah learn from that story. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm hoping um, that we'll hopefully see the book in the global database for age-friendly practices for WHO. It really is so excellent. Um, we're slowly coming to a close, unfortunately, though, for our global cafe today. Um, so the book is online and Luana has put a link in the chat for those interested. Um, could you both share a brief story perhaps that stood out to you? I know it's hard to choose just one. Um, Claire, maybe, yeah. yeah. Claire, would you like to go first? Me first? Okay, thanks. Um, well, yeah, all of the stories were so impactful and moving when they was really difficult to choose a standout. Um, I think the, the vulnerability shared by each of the contributors just demonstrates how courageous and resilient LGBTI um, people or individuals are. Um, I'd like to highlight Vivian Claire. Um, so uh, the story there was born in 1960 uh, into a strictly Catholic family and lived with gender dysphoria for many, many years. Um, and not until the age of 60 did Vivian transition. Uh, so Vivian's words about transition um, really resonated with me, describing the mental preparedness, touching on that social well-being that we spoke about earlier. So mental preparedness needed, not just preparing for procedures, but in managing anxiety um, and the various what ifs, the what ifs from a physical perspective, but a what ifs around acceptance in society as well. So I found that really touching. Thank you. I don't think I read that story yet. So that'll be uh, this afternoon for me. Um, Kelly, do you have a story you'd like to highlight? Well, I was actually going to highlight Viv's story as well. <laughs> if, um, it, she, it's just, I mean, she was so, so brave, so incredibly brave to share her story about transitioning later in life. Um, and um, I guess, yeah, there's a couple of transitioning stories in the book and all of, I think there's three, three of them probably. They're all 
are so brave. They take it's such, they take such courage to transition, um, particularly later in life. Um, yeah, and that is incredibly powerful. Um, her st Viv story and and um, Finn's story as well. So yeah, those they, they are standouts. But that all of the stories are you know unique and wonderful and um, funny and challenging and sad. Yeah, a lot, a lot. Yeah, yeah, really whole, emotion. yeah, a whole host of emotions, certainly. Um, so I'd love to hear both of your key takeaway messages from today's discussion. But to allow you to gather your thoughts, um, I'm going to first introduce our next week's topic and speaker. Um, so Luana has shared um, our banner. So please join our discussion next week, where we'll be joined by Sylvia Beals from the Stakeholder Group on Aging, who will be preparing us for following the UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, which is happening the following week at the UN headquarters in New York. Um, so Sylvia will be speaking with the IFA's very own Elizabeth Lewis on the inclusion of older people within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so back to you, Ketty and Claire. Um, would you be able to share the, your key takeaway message um, with our audience today? Yep, okay. So um, older LGBTI people are an invisible part of the older community. We are often forgotten by our own community and unseen by the heteronormative older community. It requires all organisations to proactively engage and ensure events and activities are welcoming, inclusive, respectful and safe for older LGBTI people. Thank mm. you, Kat. Lovely. Uh, yeah, my, my takeaway is, is really the, the value of inclusion and the importance of recognising the voices of vulnerable older adults and that the voices are heard. Uh, and the importance to seek out and work with those in the community who have expertise and experience um, and, and ask for their support um, in building an inclusive path forward. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and also highlighting some really lovely um, reflections from Michael in the chat as well um, of the both of you and your impact. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending another week of the IFA Global Cafe. Um, thank you for your participation and thank you as well to all the colleagues at the IFA um, who work behind the scenes to make this happen, especially um, Luana Comego. Um, so I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and look forward to seeing you next week.